Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you so much for joining our webinar today, Puzzling Precedents, Piecing Together MIWAS. My name is Amanda, and I'll be your moderator today. We have Arissa attorney Larry Gugin as our presenter. Um, I know this is a very, uh, we're going to go fairly deep into this topic, so if you miss something, don't worry, we'll be emailing you a recording and the slides after the webinar concludes. I'll be keeping the webinar muted to avoid any background noise, but we'll stop at the end for questions. Just type your question in the box below and I'll read it aloud for you. Our next webinar will be on August 8th at 1 p.m. Central and you can register at BenefitExpress.info. For now, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Larry. Thank you very much. Uh, the seminar on the 8th may change because one of the aspects of our presentation on August 8th was talking about developments. And right now, either today or tomorrow, the uh, Senate's going to vote on the on their bill, and um, it's 50-50 whether it's going to pass the Senate, and then it has to go to the House and have to get together. So the possibility of health care reform is uh, in jeopardy right now. I, I think if they don't do something over the next few weeks, it's going to be tough to do it over the next two years. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens over this next week. So stay tuned for that. Uh, the reason why uh, the reason why I'm doing this topic today is because in my practice, I've been running into more and more of multiple employer welfare arrangements or me was in my practice. And uh, for years, I never came, I knew what they were. I never came across them. And over the past probably year, I've come across six or seven. And so I thought it was important for people to realize uh, what me was our multiple employer welfare arrangements. Uh, what's the big deal? Um, and what happens if you have a MEWA? So today's topic is going to be talking about this. As Amanda indicated, uh, this topic is uh, extremely complicated. Parts of it. Um, Again, I'm going to try my best to explain it, but it can be very complicated. But I think it's extremely important to understand what the consequences are if you decide for one reason or another to have unrelated employers participating in your plan. So before so we get into the topic, we just had a quick poll um, to kind of see oh, where sorry. everybody is at with their, with their MUA strategy. Um, if you could just fill out your answer, one of the four below. And I'll give everybody a minute to vote. All right, and it's been a minute, so I'm going to close this. It looks like nobody has nobody who's attended and voted has a strategy nice. yet, so it's, we're glad you're here. Um, and the rest of you are either brokers or consultants who are here to help out your clients, and we're glad you're here. So moving on, um, I'll turn the presentation over to Larry. Thank you. All right, and looking at the, this slide of all, I, I define under Arissa. It's defined as an employee welfare plan other than arrangement that establishment uh, that is established or maintained by two or more employers to offer and provide welfare benefit uh, to their employees. Now, what's, what's important about this, we're not talking about a control group where these, there's common ownership. We're talking about situations where uh, more than one employer that's unrelated get together and they decide to offer the same medical plan, the same dental plan, and that's when a MIWA comes into play. Now, MIWAs do not include plans established or maintained under collective bargaining agreements. So we're not talking about anything dealing with unions. Uh, now, health, insure, health insurance uh, issuers and HMOs that are licensed to provide health insurance to public and employers also are excluded. So in my, in my practice, um, why, uh, how can an employer establish a MIWA? 
Well, um, there's been a number of situations where um, employers are not part of a control group, but they have common ownership. So uh, let's say somebody um, starts uh, building uh, restaurants or hotels, and each different location is a different investment group. The ownership is 40, 50, 60%, but it doesn't rise to the level of 80%. So therefore, these, these different locations, even though they're similar, they're not considered to be commonly controlled. For ease of administration, uh, and because there could be many of the same players participating, uh, they decide to establish a welfare plan uh, for all these different unrelated uh, locations or employers. And that's when you can establish a MIWA. I've seen these with restaurants, hotels, various businesses that are very close together and the ownership could be close to 80%, but not exactly 80%. And when it's not part of a control group, they're unrelated, and that's when AMIWA is created. So another situation is, and this has become very common because of healthcare, uh, of healthcare reform, um, some employers are offering um, health coverage to what we call 1099 employees. Now that term is misleading because a 1099 employee is not an employee, is an independent contractor. Uh, and so that so that employer is a different, that individual is a different employer. And when you start offering uh, and covering 1099 employees, uh, you could be creating a MIWA. Uh, and that's where another situation I've run into. Our PEOs, MIWAs, well, it depends, as it says. Uh, is the PEO a, uh, just a payroll provider? Are they the full employer where they take over everything? But the most common situation is uh, they're in co-employer co arrangement. That's the most common. So in this situation, it's kind of murky in whether a MIWA uh, can be created by a PEO. And, and again, depends on the arrangement. But again, in certain situations, they are a co-employer with the other employer. Now, what are the advantages for a small employer to be involved in AMIWA? Well, they permit um, small employers to get together and provide um, welfare benefit plans, and therefore they could have uh, greater purchasing power. So these are individuals that are participating under one plan. And benefits are provided either by purchasing insurance at more favorable rates or establishing a joint self-insured plan. Now, let me warn you, when you start doing self-insured plans, uh, that's when the states are uh, very interested in this because the states sees this as a run around the insurance rules. And many states bar, and I should say many, some states bar uh, self-funded um, MIWAs because they see that as a, as a run around the state insurance rules. So, uh, a MIWA can, can be associated sponsored plan where the employers usually have a common bond such as membership in a trade association. Uh, and generally, um, what MIWAs do is that they um, have various ERISA benefits. They could have medical, dental, um, accident, disability. And again, employers get together and they um, they have a whole array of welfare benefits. Now, what we're talking about here is we're not talking about pension plans. Uh, that's another uh, discussion. Uh, multiple employer pension plans are under a section of the um, Internal Revenue Code 413, 413D. This is welfare plans. And, and what's interesting about these welfare plans is that these MIWAs are, uh, yes, they're, uh, they can be ERISA plans, but more importantly, they can be regulated by the states. That's what makes it real interesting and, and extremely complicated. So generally, when you have an ERISA uh, welfare plan, you don't have to worry about state regulation or states being involved in telling you what to do. When you have a MIWA, that situation is quite different uh, because there is a uh, generally there's a, uh, a presumption of ERISA in this situation, uh, the federal government has given that up. Now, um, excluded from the definition of MIWA are, um, again, uh, arrangements that are uh, determined to be collective bargaining, a rural uh, electronic, electric, excuse me, cooperative, uh, those sponsored by rural uh, 
telephone cooperatives, or two or more employers are found to be members of the same control group. And again, please understand, we're talking about unrelated employers here who are getting together. And again, it, these rules do not apply to governments. These, uh, these rules apply to those employers that are subject to ERISA. And remember, government and church plans are not subject to ERISA. Please understand that. So we're talking about uh, private employers, both for-profit and not-for-profit, that are subject to these rules. So here, ERISA exemption for state regulation of EWA, although ERISA generally preempts state rules and regulations, a uh, section of ERISA 514B6 uh, subjects insured me was to state insurance rules. Um, and again, collective bargaining plans are not. Uh, but again, basically, um, the DOL has issued rules that establish when a plan is collectible, collectively bargained and, and when they're not. So again, one thing that's important about me was, and I want to stress this, this is one aspect of a ERISA plan. If you have unrelated employers participating in an, a, um, a ERISA plan, they could be subject to state regulation. So ERISA section 514 creates an exception to the ERISA preemption, which allows states to regulate MIWAs under the state insurance rules. This is extremely important because every state is slightly different in this. So in contrast to the expansive nature of ERISA's preemption blanket that covers single employer plans, Congress permitted states to regulate certain aspects of, of MIWAs. As a result, the degree of actual MIWA regulation varies from state to state. And I have examples of four or five states in the discussion of how it can be different. Now, generally, uh, some states just, uh, if you have a MIWA, they want you to register. Other states um, allow you to continue, but if you are self-insured, they may prohibit that. Other states only allow uh, MIWAs if they were sponsored by an association. So this definition is determined by the following factors. First, if the MIWA is fully insured and is ERISA covered plan, all state rules are preempted except those specifying standards requiring the maintenance, reserves, and payment of contributions. So again, in those situations, the state could just say register so we know that, that you're out there, especially if you're insured. Other states say um, you have to be an association to operate a MIWA in our states. I know uh, states like uh, Florida, California are like that. Um, and MIWAs are considered fully insured if the DOL determines that the amounts of all benefits provided by the MIWA are guaranteed under the contract or policy of insurance issued by a licensed insurance company. And again, the reason why uh, this happened in the late 80s, early 90s, there were self-funded uh, MIWAs out there that were uh, operating in states like Florida, New York, and many of them went out of business holding uh, people uninsured. So the federal government stepped in, amended ERISA, put section 514B6 in there and said, okay, the federal government, uh, we can't do this. The states, if you want to do this, um, we're going to give you power to regulate MIWAs. So this definition is determined by the following factor. If, uh, second, if a MIWA is an ERISA covered plan, which is fully insured, only the state laws are inconsistent. The category includes self-funded uh, plans or stop-loss plans. Under a stop-loss arrangement, insurance company generally agrees to reimburse plans which exceed a certain amount. If the plan itself pays out uh, out of its own uh, assets until the stop-loss trigger is reached. In state insurance regulation, these plans is not limited to reserve and contribution requirements, but encompasses other uh, insurance rules not inconsistent with ERISA. Now, what some states do if you have a self-funded MIWA, like Illinois where I'm at right now, they prohibit self-insured MIWAs because they see it as a runaround the insurance rules. Other states, for example, uh, say if you're going to have a self-insured MIWA, it's got to be sponsored by an association and we're going to treat it like an insurance company. So again, there's various, to, and, and the issue and problem, if you have a MIWA that operates, that has employees in various states, each state could in that situation, I have control over how those individuals living in that state are controlled by that MIWA and you have to meet those rules in each of those states, which could make it extremely complicated. 
So ERISA permits states to regulate MIWAs, whether they're insured or self-insured, and states have exercised this authority in diverse ways. Some states just want you to register, as I said before, others uh, prohibit certain types of MIWAs. Some states have no MIWA-specific laws. Others have sim uh, simple uh, regulation requirements. Um, and more typically, states will treat MIWAs in one degree or another the same as an insurance company. And, and I think that's an important, right there, that's an important distinction here because um, if you have a self-insured MIWAs, what, what many states do, and I know four or five that do this, you have to meet all, all the licensing, reserves, and surplus and mandated benefits rules as if you were an insurance company. Uh, some states may require employers to participate in the MIWAs to accept liability if the MIWA is unable to pay. And again, some states prohibit MIWAs entirely. They won't allow um, any MIWAs to operate. So again, if you're participating in MIWA that's in various states, each of these state rules have to be adhered to, especially if you, if you have participants that are living in those uh, in various states. Uh, often uh, states uh, exempt fully insured MIWAs from the operations of MIWA statutes. Again, they just may really want you to register. However, they are prohibited from imposing regulations related to reserves, contributions including licensing, registration, certification, financial reporting, examination, audit. Uh, a state may prohibit issuance of a policy or an association of employers unless the association meets certain criteria that are likely to, to meet the, uh, by a group of unrelated employers. So again, each state is different in that regard. And again, MIWAs that are not fully insured are subject to all state rules that are not consistent with ERISA. And some states have created special rules that exempt professional employer organizations from the MIWA rules. So again, um, if you're operating in various states as this, as this slide indicates, what you have to look at, you have to look at each state and how uh, those state rules are affected. Here's some examples, Illinois. Uh, Illinois, there's no regulation of MIWAs, but they do prohibit self-insured MIWAs. So it, as, if, you're, if you're insured, there's no registration, there's no rules in that regard, but as soon as you become self-insured, um, the Department of Insurance can shut you down. Um, Indiana, uh, MIWAs are, re are required to make quarterly filings. Uh, MIWAs are must file an annual re uh, renewal, but there's, a, there's no prohibitions against self-insured MIWAs. Um, under the state of Wisconsin, for example, self-insured MIWAs are treated as unlicensed insurers. So again, um, each state is completely different. State of Michigan. Michigan requires license uh, of MIWAs that do business with, an, uh, with Michigan employers that are not fully insured. To obtain a license, a, uh, a MIWA must be controlled by its members and have adequate cash reserves and purchase stop loss carriers. A complete description of MIWA uh, requirements can be found in, in chapter 70 of the uh, Michigan Insurance Code. And again, um, to see what other states are doing, I've, I, I've included a chart of all the various states and what the state rules say. And again, uh, uh, some states only allow MIWAs, for example, if they're sponsored by an association. Now, uh, MIWAs are covered by ERISA only if they qualify as an employee welfare plan. Um, and again, what that means in layman's language is that Will the MIWA rules apply on the plan level or on the employer level? Uh, if they're treated as an ERISA plan, there's one filing, one plan. Um, if it's, if it's um, treated as a, uh, a plan on the employer level, there could be all kinds of filings, all kinds of different plans involved. It can get rather complicated. So employee welfare benefit plans are those that are established or maintained by the employer and employer association of both for the purpose of providing health care and other welfare benefits. So there's a two-step process there to determine whether an ERISA plan has been established. The first step is determine whether the benefits provided by the plan are welfare benefits. That's very, very common and that's very simple. If you provide medical, dental, um, insurance, that type of thing, yes. 
And the second step is to determine whether the plan is established or maintained by the employer or by an employer organization. So risk applies in the MIWA uh, level only if where the MIWA qualifies as a bona fide group or an association of employers within the meaning of RISA section 3.5 definition of employer. Several court cases and DOL advisory opinions have addressed this. As these authorities recognize, a MIWA can uh, be an ERISA plan for Form 5500 purposes only if the group of uh, or association of employers participating in the MIWA satisfies the commonality of interest and control. Both of these tests must be met before the MIWA itself be considered an ERISA plan. Now, what's important here and the reason why they do this is to make it difficult for an organization to sponsor a plan and to get unrelated employers involved in that plan and as do a run around the insurance rules. I think that's the whole purpose behind it. So, um, and again, if you want um, a MIWA to apply on the plan level, that means it's very simple. There's one 5,500, there's one set of filings, there's one plan document, it's very simple. If it's determined that um, the second requirement doesn't apply and there's no commonality between the employers, then you could have 15 or 20 different ERISA plans. That's why this is extremely important. So the commonality of interest test requires that the entity maintain the plan and the individuals benefiting from it be, be tied to a common economic or representative interest, not simply a provision to receive welfare benefits. According to DOL uh, guidance, the determination whether an association or group of employers meet this test will depend on how the association uh, solicits members, who is entitled to participate and who actually participates, the process in which the association is formed, the association's purposes, their relationship with members and outside organizations, and the powers and rights and privileges. So they don't want just employers getting together and buying insurance together. They they need some bond together. They can't be they can be they are, yes, they're unrelated, but there has to be some bond with them. The control test requires the employer members of the association to control and direct activities. And the control must exist in both form and substance. And the test is designed to exclude from ERISA coverage. Those entities exist only for optimal purpose of selling insurance coverage to employer members. So, so this bond has to be very deep. And if it's an association, it has to be organized, not just for the purpose of selling insurance and providing insurance to his members. So to pass this test, the representative employer members must be involved in designing and administering the plan of benefits made available to its employees. Now, let's say you have the commonality. There's uh, people, um, there's enough common interest between these employers. It's um, MIWA uh, rules apply in the plan level. One of the requirements, if you do establish a MIWA, uh, are different um, reporting reporting requirements. And MIWAs are required to file, as this slide uh, 21 indicates, are required to file Form M1, annual report for multiple employer plans, all right, uh, for the purpose of determining the requirements of HIPAA, Medical Health Parity Act, Newborn Mothers, and Mother's Act, and the reporting requirements allow for earlier detection of unsound was to reduce the risk of financial losses. Now, I found that many times when um, unrelated employers get together, they form me when there's enough commonality. The problem is that they haven't, uh, because there's various times you have to file an M1. And if you get audited and you haven't filed an M1, if you look at the bottom of, um, slide 21, the DOL's uh, interim final rules also set civil penalties at, at $1,527 per day uh, for the failure to file an M1. So inadvertently, if uh, five or six different employers get together, um, establish a MIWA, have a plan, uh, they haven't filed an M1, um, 
they could be penalized $1,527 per day if they get audited by the DOL. So the rules apply to other entities that offer or provide coverage for medical care to employees, two or more employees, but claim not to be MIWAs because they establish or maintain pursuant to collective bargaining. So collective bargaining doesn't apply. All right, let's skip this. Also, MIWAs are required to register with the DOL before they begin operations. In addition to these rules, uh, MIWAs must report to the DOL annually regarding the ERISA compliance. Um, and MIWAs uh, must comply with uh, both requirements by filing a form M1. And M1 has to be filed electronically. Now, what's also very interesting, in addition to filing the M1, the, um, the plan also has to file a 5500. So every year you have to file an M1 and a 5500. Now, in the case with the MIWA is an ERISA plan, only one 5500 needs to be filed because they will be considered a single employer plan. And participating employers will, uh, then will not have an independent form 5500. Um, form 5500s, usually there is an exception form 5500s that you don't have to file one if you have under, under 100 participants. Starting in 2013, that exception no longer applies. If for MIWA, and you have four or five businesses getting together and buying insurance, you have to file an M1, but also um, if you're under 100, you have to file a 5500. So all MIWAs that are ERISA plans must file form 5500. And that's another thing that some employers are getting involved in. They all, all of a sudden realize we're unrelated, we have a MIWA, and we haven't filed 5500s. So again, in unison, you have to file both. So the reporting requirement applies to administrators, including third-party administrators of the MIWAs. Uh, in the case of MIWA, what is not designated the plan as sponsor, cannot be identified jointly or severally. The person or person is actually responsible for the control of disposition and management of cash or property uh, must file the M1. So in addition to the uh, annual reporting, uh, reporting uh, special form M1 must be filed 30 days prior to operating in the new state. And then within 30 days after triggering events, including operating a new state, merger with an, another MIWA, or the number of employees re receiving coverage under the MIWA increases by 50%, or there's some other material change. So that, there, there could be a situation where you could be filing multiple um, M1s. That's because the DOL wants to have very close uh, control over what this MIWA does. So again, under, uh, under the um, regulations, the MIWA administrators must file a form uh, with the DOL for purpose of determining whether the requirements of certain health care rules apply. The rules are set penalties for failure to file the form, and the principal purpose of the rule is to determine the extent of compliance with MIWAs with, the, with ERISA. Um, also, too, um, there's also various exceptions to filing a MIWA. So the rule also clarifies that reporting is not required if the entity would not constitute a MIWA, uh, but for the following three circumstances. Uh, if there's common control of at least 25%, so if you look at the organizations and you, and you look at the employers, if they have a common ownership of each one of at least 25%, you still have to file the 5500, but the M1 would not be required. So again, I have some organizations that the common ownership is 40, 50, 60%. In that situation, the plan would still have to file a 5,500, but an M1 would not be required. There's still a MIWA. Don't get me wrong, and the, and the state requirements would apply, but this is one extremely important exception. The second exception is if created by a control, a uh, change of control, a temporary 
um, arrangement providing medical benefits to the employees of more than one employer created a change by a change of control. You have a situation where you have two employers that are related, and because of a sale, the two are unrelated, but they decide to continue for a very short period of time to be covered by the same plan. And in this situation, and even though there's no common ownership, uh, they're temporary, it's a temporary MIWA, and that's an exception um, for filing an M1. So there are exceptions for filing an M1. Uh, also, um, another exception is very small number of persons who are not employees or former employees. Remember I told you before, there could be a situation where uh, a employer decides to cover 1099 employees. So in that situation, this exception would apply. So if you decide to cover um, 10 to 9 employees, technically that is a MIWA. But what they said is if the number of employees or firm employees covered by the arrangement determined in the last day of the plan year, uh, determine that this is that does not exceed one percent of the total employees. So if you decide to cover two or three uh, 1090 employees in that situation, just because you covered them, even though you are considered to be a a MIWA, still you don't have to file an M1. So please remember, in many situations, an M1 would have to be. Uh, would have to be filed if you formed a me one it may have to be filed multiple times a year but at least once a year there are three important exceptions uh, and please remember those exceptions so again though uh, please remember you still have to file uh, a form 5500 again and and what's important here is the the rules either apply on the employer level or on the plan level if it applies on the employer level because there's no commonality of interest, then you may have, again, multiple 5500s. So if ERISA does not apply on the MIWA level, each employer providing benefits to its employees through the MIWA would be considered a, to uh, maintain a separate ERISA plan to be subject to COBRA. For example, if unrelated employers provide medical benefits through a MIWA and it's not an ERISA benefit plan, each of these employers will be deemed to maintain their own ERISA plan. It is a mess. Multiple 5500s, multiple situations. And these plans separately um, exist separately for COBRA purposes, and each employer would therefore be responsible for COBRA due to the exception in ERISA Section 340. So if ERISA does not apply on the MIWA level, each employer providing benefits to its employees through the MIWA will be considered to maintain a separate plan. If the unrated employers provide medical benefits through a MIWA that is not an employer welfare plan, each of these employers will be deemed to maintain its own ERISA plan, and these plans exist separately for COBRA purposes, and each employer will therefore be responsible for COBRA compliance. And the unlikely event that, uh, that the MIWA itself is not a RISA plan, it appears that instead of participating employers, the designated plan administrator of the MIWA would be responsible for the COBRA compliance. HIPAA. Uh, each separate um, private sector employer participating in a MIWA governed by ERISA is generally uh, have to establish a separate group health plan for the benefit of, of the employees. And in this, in this case, if it's considered it doesn't apply on the plan level. Each separate plan is required to comply with the HIPAA portability rules. In addition, MIWA itself would be responsible for compliance with the portability rules. And first, those MIWAs that are themselves considered group health plans under the ERISA would be subject to the portability rules set forth under ERISA. And again, it depends if you have an ERISA plan on the plan level or on the uh, employer level. Second, all MIWAs covering private sector employers, regardless of whether they satisfy the ERISA test for separate plans, appear to be subject to a HIPAA. So it doesn't really matter. It's that who has to comply with these rules. Enforcement. Uh, DOL has the power to uh, issue a cease and desist order against abusive MIWAs and individuals associated with them. 
health insurance issuers, insurance companies are also licensed and approved by each state in which they offer health insurance rules are accepted from the coverage under that rule. And DOL may issue a cease and desist order without prior notice or hearing when it determines it is reasonable cause to believe that the MIWA or any individual acting on behalf of the MIWA has engaged in uh, conduct that is fraudulent, creates an immediate danger to public safety, and is causing a reasonably expected uh, uh, to cause significant imminent and um, irreparable uh, public in, uh, injury. The DOL also has the authority under ERISA and the final rules to seize MIWA's assets. It appears that the MIWA is a financial jeopardy and the normal course of rules require the DOL to obtain court authorization prior to seizing assets. The DOL may issue a summary seizure in order without prior uh, court authorization of reasonably believes that it is in delay in issuing the order. So again, even though the states have some control over the situation, the DOL has the authority if they deem that the MIWA is operating fraudulently to shut it down. But also you have to deal with the states too. They have the authority under these MIWAs too. Amanda, do you have any questions? Yes, we do. Um, just one moment. My experience with group insurance arrangements is that the small employers participate in the GIA to get better rates almost sounds like a MIWA. What are your thoughts? It all depends if they share risk. If they don't share risk, then it's not a MIWA. If they're separately um, rated, then I, I don't think it's a MIWA. Uh, if they're individually rated in this situation, then there's no problem. But if they are rated together, then technically it's a MIWA. So um, look at that very closely. Well, we'll leave the questions open for a moment while we talk a little bit about Benefit Express. So if you have any, please type in the question box below while I tell you a little bit about us. So Benefit Express, uh, we help participants understand and use their benefits wisely so they can be accountable for their own health care. And we enable you as the plan sponsor to enable and deliver your benefits strategy. We have a whole host of products that we can help you with um, that are all listed here. Larry, if you could do the next slide. We have 250 employees serving our clients from two service centers, one here in Schaumburg, where I am, uh, near Chicago, and one in Rancho Cordova, California. And here's a little bit more about our clients and who we serve. We have a whole range of sizes of folks we work with. And one more. Um, and here are some of our integrations. We work with a whole bunch of awesome partners, including Optum uh, and Summit HR and Payrolls. So we now offer time and attendance. And if you have any questions, you can contact sales at mybenefitexpress.com or you can let me know here uh, in the questions that you'd like somebody to reach out to you uh, and I'll have a sales representative get in touch. Other than that, um, I don't see any- uh, Amanda, let me, let me do some um, closing um, thoughts on this. All right, um, as I said in the beginning, um, more and more I'm seeing unrelated employers getting together and sometimes it's by design, sometimes by accident. Um, in that situation, if you as a broker or a, a, as an advisor see unrelated employers participating in a uh, group medical plan, group dental plan, whatever. Uh, in that situation, um, there's some issues and problems you're going to have. One, if you have a, a MIWA, uh, it's subject to state regulation. Now, in many areas, if you're, uh, if you are considered to be insured, uh, there's not a problem. But if you are self-insured, Many states have prohibitions against me was being self-insured because, as I indicated before, they see it as a uh, runaround the insurance rules. So please, uh, because if you don't come out of there, one of the exceptions for the M1, the M1 is has to be filed when the uh, MIWA is organized, and then when you add states to the MIWA. So again, those penalties can be very severe. If you have any questions or comments about me was and want more information and want to discuss them, please contact me. That's my contact information and I can help you. I've done a lot of MIWA work and as you can see from the area, it's extremely complicated and please um, look into this. And, and one of the things I've discovered about MIWAs, 
many of the consultants, when they're when they're advising employers, don't do a control group analysis. Uh, one of my broker clients had me come in and do a broker analysis, and this company had 16 different entities, what they thought was a control group. After I did my analysis, out of that 16, only two were related, 14 were not. And they were all participating in a self-funded plan. So again, this is where it comes up. This is, where, again, when entities start building and have different um, investor groups for each entity and they are they, then participating under the same uh, medical plan, that's when you inadvertently create a MIWA. Um, there's ways of fixing this, there's ways of filing these forms, especially if you haven't filed the 5500, where now, because of the under 100 rule doesn't apply, now you have 5500s back to 2013. Uh, if you get caught, not only do you have a penalty for the 5500, but you have a penalty for not filing M1 if one of the exceptions doesn't apply. So it can get rather costly for the employer or the employers in this situation. All right. Again, thank you very much. All right. Thank you guys for joining us. And again, we'll see you next time on August 8th at 1 p.m. Central. Have a great afternoon.